Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, those who have rejoined us and those who are here for the first time. It's really lovely to see all your faces. Um, we are thrilled to be here today at the Bradford Literature Festival. My name is Rebecca Latham. I am the Deputy Literary Manager at the Royal Shakespeare Company. I'm joined today by director and dramaturg Chris White and playwright Ishi Din. Ishi is an award-winning writer for screen, stage and radio. Currently, he is under commission from the RSC. Um, other original projects in development include a crime drama for Lime Pictures, a feature film, Fraud, through Gurinder Charter's company Bendit Networks and Park United. His most recent play, Approaching Empty, opened at the Kiln Theatre in London in January 2019. Ishii was the 2012 Pearson Writer in Residence at the Manchester Royal Exchange, and in 2013, Snookered won Best New Play at Manchester Theatre Awards. Chris is a freelance director and dramaturg specialising in international collaborations, Shakespeare, new writing and projects with young people. As a dramaturg, he has worked for Soho Theatre's Writers Lab for 10 years, led playwriting projects for Synergy Theatre Project with prisoners and ex-prisoners, and is currently working closely with several playwrights developing new plays. Welcome both. Um, in today's masterclass, we'll be exploring world building. How does a writer conceive of and create a world for their play? And then how is that interpreted on stage? Can we start by explaining what we mean by world building? Uh, what does that include when I say the term world building? Ishii, I might start with you, if that's OK. OK. So, hello, everybody. Thank you for, for, for coming first. I, my take on world building is that uh, setting, where it's set, time, um, place, uh, what's happening outside of what we see on the stage, you know, how do we give the audience that impression? How do I uh, build this place where the, 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 the characters are going to sort of interact with each other? And how do I go about uh, creating and, and uh, being able to express that? So it's not just in my head, the audience uh, uh, get a sense of where it is and what's going on and uh, what else is happening. So I, I have that in mind. We were talking earlier about process. I, uh, I will start off with something quite uh, mundane, uh, a barn, a snooker hall, a taxi uh, cab office, and then start layering that. Winter, summer, spring, you know, day, night, uh, city, countryside, whatever those sort of things are, I'll then start adding layers to it until hopefully by the time it, 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 it's produced and people get to experience it, there is a sense that there's, there's a complete world. We're just sort of looking at this bit, but just outside we c the bits that we can't see, there's a whole world that's been created and there's activity that's going on out there but we don't get to experience it but the characters are fully aware of, aware of it i think it's it's whatever makes that play unique um so it's it's all of those things that ishi said it's time it's place it's sort of detail as well but it's how how does the environment inform how people behave and what are the structures within that environment? What are the kind of, what are the rules? What are the expectations between people in it? And that might be, let's say if you're, I take one of Ishi's plays, Approaching Empty, if that play is set um, exclusively in the office. Yeah, it's set exclusively um, in, an, in an office, a taxi office. Um, it's, you know, some of those questions might be, oh right, well, 
what is the expected behavior of people of what what are the codes of behavior that are expected in this space without anyone ever saying that out loud we know that from our own lives that when we enter certain spaces where we're with certain groups of people we sort of often intrinsically or we, we kind of learn um patterns of codes expectations of behavior and in in a way i think a play can do that without just replicating a classroom an office um as, as you know a university lecture hall it's maybe drawing on some of those real places but then maybe shifting the dial a little bit so what you know what what makes this world not just a location but have a set of kind of rules or codes or details which are affecting the action which are affecting the people and i would add with that the audience as well so like i think um that there's a really nice description i think you put becky in that of that in terms of you know how is that different to just writing generally or to kind of making stuff for screen well if the the sort of uh, the kind of proposition is that there will be people present you might be deliberately making a piece of theater for one person or it might be in a huge theater but either way it's about you know bringing people into contact within a space so in terms of how you build that world within the play this would be you know the director would think about but also the playwright as well of like what what is what is imagined or what is possible about the the connection or some people call it like the contract between the the, the performers and the audience as well. I think that's part of the, the world building as well. So it's both the, the kind of the setting, the place where the action is happening, but in the acknowledgement that it's going, to, it's going to be happening live in a space as well. It's not in some magical TARDIS that people are peering through a curtain in. Yeah. So I'll touch on what Chris has just mentioned. So what I've got written in front of me, which Chris has seen, is that theatre in the traditional sense could be described as a narrow but deep experience, something that is, um, a limited amount of people are able to watch but in a rich and intimate way and I've also acknowledged that there's a caveat to that now because we're sort of exploring digital platforms so now lots and lots of people are able to watch plays which is very exciting but when we think about traditional theatre we think about being in a space in front of a live audience and a version of the show that will only be seen once it might be the same script the same direction the same actors but there are always sort of certain um, elements that happen only once in that live space so my next question to both of you, and feel free to answer it as you'd like. Um, how do we learn about characters and story beyond what we see on stage in real time? And the question is, how does exposition function in theatre? Okay. Um, I think it, it, the, the, uh, it's important as, 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 as a writer to uh, give context to your to your audience. So um, the, the, it's it's trying to figure. It's really important, but it just can't be that. Uh, it's really important that uh, the audience knows, for instance, that this is uh, Eeps in nineteen fourteen. You, you know. The idea is, well, it's important the audience knows that this is where we are and this is what we're going. How then am I going to weave that in so it feels natural, that it feels like, oh, this is the inf this was how this these people would talk to each other and it's not just for the benefit of the audience. It's sort of uh, crafting, crafting the dialogue in a way and crafting the action in a way where it's also releasing information to to the audience so they know all right okay we're in eeps you know we're in eeps it's 1914 all right these are indian soldiers they've they, they, they came on a boat you know uh and they uh, uh it's it's the first time they've they've been to europe it's the first time they've been to france and stuff like this so it's crafting your dialogue to get that information across. Some of it could be done by set, you know, uh, in, in approaching empty. Um, it was, uh, we were in a taxi office, there was a map on the wall, there was a dartboard, there was a coffee machine, there was a guy on a mic. You get, you get some of that fr fr from, from there. Um, in Snookered, 
the, the, there was the obvious things. There was a, there was a, it's called snooker, but there was a pool table, there was a bar, there was a barman. So you get a sense of that, but then slowly you start to realise, oh, these pe four people are friends. Ah, it's somebody's birthday. Oh, actually, the person whose birthday is isn't here. Ah, actually, the, the person, you know, uh, whose birthday is died. Oh, he died five years ago. And that slowly comes out over the course of the play because you can't, it's very difficult for, 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 uh, for it to sound natural as if, if one of the characters just sort of says, well, we meet every, far, uh, every year to celebrate the birthday of, you know, uh, Tani. And uh, this year we're going to do it in a snook club and we're going to get really drunk. We don't talk to each other like that, do we? There's lots of information we already know, but the audience doesn't know. So it's trying to figure out a way of getting, letting the audience know that within the context of like how people would talk to each other. So it's, it's, it's thinking about that and how we get that, that, that information, that ex exposition out, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, and, and you pick up little sort of tricks. Chris, I might um, focus this question slightly different for you, but jumping off from what Ishi's just said, you work a lot with uh, writers at all stages in their career, but I wondered if you noticed something with sort of first time writers or early stage writers where they, there's a commonality with how they approach world building. Are there sort of tropes that you notice with people who write first plays when it comes to world building or yeah, exposition? I think um, like probably some people here will have had this if you have shared your work with other people. One of the things is that if you're writing about a world that you know intimately, either one that you've experienced or one you've sort of researched, like um, if she's talking about, you know, Belgium in the First World War, which is true of uh, Wipers, his play, um, sometimes the desire to show that can be so great that there is too much information. And so that the, almost that the writer kind of, shepherding a kind of security of saying oh, i've got this i know i know i know everything about this place don't worry it's fine you know i'm a reliable source you can trust me i'm not spinning you some sort of fancy yarn um and almost over kind of emphasizing the plausibility that can happen um and like ishi said as well sometimes even if that isn't the case in the need to share context and information the way that characters are talking to each other can become compromised by that release of information there is no there's no sort of straightforward or easy thing about that you know I, I i'm sure um you know i've read drafts of plays by sort of very experienced brilliant writers who who, who do that it's and it's in a way not something to worry about like it's a natural thing sometimes like so what okay i've said too much so be it i can always sort of like change it or pull it back later i think sometimes the act of that first draft requires that to be on the page and it's one of the things I've learned sort of working with writers over a period of time is not to over invest in a first draft and the same for you guys kind of writing plays like the first draft is not the play it's just the first stage of you writing the play its whole shape can change the form can change the people in it can change the point of view can change it's 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 you moving towards like that story you want to tell and the world you want to do I would say now though I think there is a shift now that I, I encounter a lot of playwrights who go the other way. Who are like, you know what, F um, forget it. Um, I, I don't need to give context with my stage directions. I don't need to say where we are. I don't wanna say where we are. I want the primacy of the voice or the experience and or identity of the character who's speaking to be everything. And uh, I, I personally, I really enjoy that. I find that kind of quite exciting. Sometimes it can be a little bit too elusive for an audience maybe, but it just goes to show, like you're saying, that there's no single way of doing it, but that you both options are completely possible. It is, it's possible to write a play with no stage directions, where simply the specificity of the voice of the character or characters means that that world and enough exposition is still, you know, achieved. We did a workshop this morning, which some of you were present at, where we looked at two of Ishii's plays. One of them is contemporary and one of them is a period piece. Ishii, I know you mentioned a little bit earlier mm. about the sort of stage directions at the beginning of the play. 
do you feel more at home writing in the contemporary world or a period world or is it sort of like bringing the same skill set to either? Um, a little bit of both. I uh, essentially incredibly lazy person so I quite like writing about contemporary. I just find it easier because it's there's less for me to do. I can you know concentrate a bit more on on the on on what it is I find uh, uh, you know uh, but this is not to say I've, my RSC is uh, commission is a period piece white as was 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 something that I do I think what's important for me is I like to uh, concentrate on character and 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 let things sort of go from there because like I was sort of saying this morning that you know characters endure through time so it doesn't matter whether it's a it's a barn in the first world war or 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 a snooker club in 2012 2014 in 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 the north of England you know the the, the characteristics uh, or the desires and the and the uh, and the anxieties and the fears of the characters remit will are just as valid whether it's uh, whether it's it's Belgium during the First World War or 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 Middlesbrough uh, uh, in the in the present day, um, I, I sort of personally find that um, having a contemporary, especially as you, you know, for, for for those of you who are going to be new writers, it's just less to for for, for, for you to be worried about. Uh, or, or, or less work for you. It helps just to do something if you were to do something con contemporary. This is not to say that you shouldn't do anything or that some people are really comfortable sort of thinking, oh, well, actually, I'm going to do, I love sci-fi, so I'm going to set it in, in the future. Or I'm a huge fan of history, and what I really want to do uh, is, is, is set something in the Mughal era of, of India or, or, you know, Henry VIII's card or whatever that that is but from a personal point of view I just you know contemporaries feels like less work it isn't <laughs> but can, I, can I jump isn't. in on that yeah, like cause obviously he's being like incredibly modest um and like <laughs> bashing himself but um but like it, what she describes as, as lazy is not what is like evident in his plays at all and look at it in other ways actually the fact that if something is contemporary and it's your experience, the fact that you will have seen it, witnessed it, been affected by it, had some kind of emotional imprint, like, you know, you're related to it. It's not just about familiarity or ease. It's also that you've got skin in the game, right? That, you, you know, that you, it's something that you maybe have been affected by, so like a perspective that you have experienced that perhaps you don't see in theatres or you don't see on screens. So all the more reason to you know to, to make that world or that story or your um kind of um sensibility or your kind of experience the the thing that leads you to create the story because you can mine it you can sort of inquire about yourself your relationship to it and one of the things that i think in theater that's always really important to remember is that we all to varying degrees we we watch so much tv so much film our phones like we're so dominated by screens where establishing shots they might be half a second or they might be two seconds and there might be a series of them before anyone said any words which is a completely different craft anyway but it's given us great context background like even a sense of the weather the sm you can do so much and in theatre it's different therefore place cannot just be background so like is is she's talking about those plays you know one one in a taxi office one in a barn in the First World War, one in a taxi office in Middlesbrough, kind of near contemporary. Like there, oh, it's set there. It's way more than set there. <laughs> like those places become characters in the play in a way that in, I think, in, in, in screen work, it's, it's less, it's just a different language. But in theatre, that has to be the case. It can't just be, oh, I'm going to set it there. Like all of those characters are affected by those places, the choices they make, how they interact. It's like so that, yeah, so like, I say the place has to be an active ingredient rather than a, than a backdrop to the play. And with your director's hat on, I used the words um, contemporary or period piece earlier, and I wonder if we can switch that up a little bit and think of them as naturalistic or 
abstract. Sure. And I wondered if you had to uh, sort of draw towards one of the other. Do you prefer imagining a naturalistic world compared to an abstract world? Or is it, again, similar question to what I asked, is she yeah. the same set of skills that you bring to either process? I think it's a really good question. I, I think um, for me, and this is just personal, I think um, every director, every person is different. But for me, it's about where is the writing and the writer leading you? So whether that writer is someone who's sat next to you and you're kind of discovering that world together or maybe you're helping kind of shape the play, you know, as it's being made might be one thing. Or whether that writer is long dead, you know, and you can never like kind of talk with them in the same way. Whether it's detailed moment to moment naturalism or, or something really stark and abstract, I still think it's your job to be to gravitate towards what the play is asking so that you as a director can illuminate it for first of all the people that you're working with and then the audience I think mm -hmm. that's kind of simple really like or not that isn't simple but I think the the challenge is a simple one in terms of what you're being asked to do I think I love both it depends I love like it depends like but there might be there's a play that I worked on called Boobies Bay um, which is a small cove in Cornwall and the play is yeah it's naturalistic and it's really important to understand that place, that community, how specific it is. It's not a community, I'm not Cornish, I've never lived there, don't know anything about it. So spending time there was really important. Drawing maps on the wall, mining the information the play gives you, that approach was really important. Yeah, to be kind of detailed and dogged and forensic and kind of making a shape of that. Other plays I've done that are absolutely non-naturalistic where that work would seem kind of pointless or, or absurd mm -hmm. where it's about like, kind of exploring scenes and with different like spaces between people trying to find little images that kind of occur throughout a play trying to find what the like physical language of it might be so yeah the approach would shift yeah and, and, and just to sort of carry carry on with that when I um, imagined snookered it, it, it came out of I was uh, staying in the backpackers hostel. I didn't know many people in London at the time and I'd come down and I'd sit in the bar for, for, nothing, for, for nothing better to do. And uh, I used to watch students from around the world, backpackers who, who were sort of traveling and they'd be playing pool. And I, I, I used to think, I should write something about me and my mates, we play pool. And that's, it just really came out of that because I was sat there and I was thinking, oh, it, you know, uh, yeah, I should write. And then from that kernel of, oh, th there's a pool table involved, it was then, oh, well, what's it about? Well, it's about friends. Ah, OK, then. So what's that about then? What happens? Well, it's about this. Well, what, oh, and then this happens. It's a birthday party. They're going to get really drunk. It's about where do people get drunk? Birthday parties? Well, what's a thingy? And just extrapolating from that point, and it really did start from watching, like, some backpackers playing pool and thinking, oh, I should maybe I should write something about some friends who play pool. And then it all sort of came. With Wipers was slightly different. Uh, it was, uh, uh, somebody came and said, you know, w w would you like to write a play about soldiers in the First World War, Indian soldiers in particular? And I was sort of like, oh yeah, that'd, that'd be fantastic. And I was watching Jarhead. I don't know if anybody who's seen the movie Jarhead, it's about the first, uh, f first, uh, the Gulf War and uh, the premise is that these soldiers spend a lot of time doing absolutely nothing. And I was like, oh, fascinating. Where should we put them? And the first draft was in a trench. And then I was like, oh, maybe not a trench. And then I was sort of thought, what about a barn? And then I did a bit of Googling barns in Belgium. Oh, yeah, there we go. And we extrapolated from, from that. We sort of start thinking about Ah, uh, right, so they've got this time on hand, there's some action going on, right, that's where we do it. Just come out of action, they're in a barn, and then extrapolate from, from that. So you don't really need a huge amount of inspiration, for want of a better word, mm -hmm. to sort of start. You just find something that's really interesting to you, and then start asking questions. Ah, uh, what do I want it to be? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I do this? What if I do that? If I do this, what's the implications of that? And it sort of grows, and it's a process. I think it's really important to uh, 
to acknowledge and sort of put out into the world that all everything everything that 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 you write it won't be that first draft that's just the first part of the process and if you want to override it override it and if you if you don't put enough in don't it's it's okay because you're going to come back to it you're going to give it some time and you're going to, you know care and nurture it and for a lot of times i don't really know who the characters are till about draft three mm. that's when i'll write a line of dialogue and think they'd never <laughs> say that and i'd delete it and come back who would what would this character say actually that's what they'd say because that's who they are but it takes time so as as as, as writers and as aspiring writers give yourself the time don't overburden yourself with like i've got to get it perfect because you're going to somebody's going to read it and say that's brilliant can you make these changes what was this about we didn't get that and and you're going to have to come back as well the important thing is getting to the end and finishing it and, and, and having a story and issue you've mentioned two of your plays there snookered and wipers that have one location mm -hmm. and i wonder what does having a single setting do to your characters and the story and then I have sort of a second question, which is how do you invite the outside world in if you're in one location only? Yeah. Um, so one, I always find that having it in one location intensifies it. It sort of concentrates everything. There's no release of pressure of, uh, of anything. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen within this place. I, I, I like that idea. Um, I think th then it's important to sort of start thinking about what's going on in the outside world and how am I bringing it into into this into this 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 space I've sort of chosen for these characters, um, and it's really useful for me. I think then to start thinking about the world outside of it usually because I've run out of things for these people to say to each other. Um, you know, it's an act of discovery writing a play. You sort of start digging into it, and early on you start running out of things. Like, yeah, they've told each other that they don't like Abdul. How many times? I can't keep saying. You know, with Snook, the great trick I used to do when I used to get stuck was I'd make him go to the bar, <laughs> and everybody used to comment after the play, they used to say, I've never seen somebody drink that much, you know, every five minutes they're going for shots. And I was like, I used to run out of things to say. And I was like, right, they go to the bar, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, but it, 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 that's a great way when you have one setting is to then let the ins outside world come in and figure out a way of sort of doing it um, with approaching empty. It was sort of like, uh, it was the day Margaret Thatcher died. And uh, yeah, the opening line of the play is something like, uh, "The bitch is dead, eh?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we and we and that you sort of so just by that little thing as an audience yeah. member, you think, "Oh, it's then, it's that day, it's the day Margaret Thatcher died," you know, and already you've set the world up, haven't you? In very economic way, you've just thought, "All right, it's 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 sort of like when did she die?" But you know, it's it's contemporary, it's this, Margaret Thatcher's just died. I did toy with the idea of it being Princess Diana's death, but I chose Margaret Thatcher because, well, the, 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 it, it went on, these, these guys worked together. So, you know, um, so that, I think, setting it in one place helps with you setting the world up. And also, like, um, it, there's something that you're again you're sort of under acknowledging as a craft that like that you're you're taking the strictness of the medium of like Becky saying of like everyone's going to be in this shared space there's nowhere to go there's no release valve I think was the mm -hmm. phrase you used therefore with the taxi office people come people go in snooker they they go to the bar and they come back but you're sort of playing with the permutations of people mm -hmm. so the cro you know of like who comes who goes and that's the play, isn't it? People come in, people go out. Like, you know, they're sort of on they go. There's something really simple about it, but how you kind of manipulate and manage that becomes fun. So then of which pairings and threes and fours of those characters, it gives you a um, like a microscope to, as you say, characters, your focus as a writer. 
like you're sort of pinning those characters and not letting them anywhere either so it it's like a yeah like a kind of you're you're making sort of intense playground in which to explore and expose these people and 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 as i we, we sort of touched upon in the workshop this this morning was that um you know it's important to at some point in your process of writing the play figure out what these people want you know what do they want immediately what in 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 the sort of in the in the in the in the timeline of the play itself what do they want because then that gives them something to uh, uh, to hustle for you know one character wants the other one to stay in Bradford because he lives in London so he's sort of trying to persuade him and you know one character wants his butcher's halal butcher's shop to be big corporate things so he's got these big dreams you know one character just doesn't want anybody to find out that he's got his wife white girlfriend pregnant <laughs> you know one character is the complete opposite and he he's he's in sort of uh, just wants children and is, is going through IVF treatment him and his missus and they but they want something and then within the world of that play it's the pursuit of that want is that what we're, we're witnessing as an audience and how these characters are going about getting what they want you know that plays out over an hour an hour and a half or whatever that that makes it interesting for me as a writer it's a very narcissistic you have to have an element of of that narcissism about you or or or, or, or something like that that says sit down there i want to tell you something and give me some money as well for the honor buy your ticket come in sit down i need something i've got something really important to tell you about who we are as people or human beings or what the world is or what politics is about or what whatever that thing that you want to write about what the future holds for us you know but at the center of it is us as human beings and that's you know always keep that in mind who we are as human beings i i think mm. really useful useful sort of thing to 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 latch on to um, I'm going to ask Chris and Ishi one or two more questions and then I'm going to open it up if anyone has a question. So if you've got something that you're mulling over, if you get it ready and I'll um, open it up in just a moment. But I wondered, Chris and Ishi, if you had sort of one dynamite piece of advice that you would offer to writers when it comes to considering world building in particular, but maybe also just approaching writing their first play. Um, and I guess with the directive of being really bold and imaginative, like what would you like to give them permission to be able to do when it comes to thinking of either world building or approaching their first play? Do you want to, oh, okay, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, okay, it's, a really, it's a really brilliant question. I think um, I would, hopefully this is helpful, sh shut me up if it isn't, um, try and give you a couple of specific examples of plays that I think do this really brilliantly. Um, so there's a play that... Um, play I directed that was written uh, by my wife uh, um, who's called Hannah Khalil and she wanted to write a play about Palestine which is where her family is from and she was continually told that she had to choose whose story it was that there had to be a turning point a climax all the various things that um, story structure is associated with um, and it didn't feel right instinctively it didn't feel right to her to do that um, so she wrote a play with many scenes, about 30, 30 plus scenes in many different time periods with over 35 characters. So it sort of seems unstageable, like, come on, who's going to do, who's going to do that? Um, but her instinct was right because she felt if in order for, and I'm speaking for her so that like, uh, I don't mean that in a sort of possessive way, but like just because I worked with a play closely with her and directed it, that um, she felt the the only kind of accurate way that story could be told is from a multiplicity of viewpoints and where no scene had the luxury of lasting that long because the sensation of the people involved is that no one had the luxury of, of being rooted anywhere. So, t So what she you know only once she'd written it could she articulate no this is about displacement 
this is about displacement as a as a as a condition and i can't put that in a play with four people and they all you know they're all here and it's this person's story and that's the protagonist it's just those rules don't apply um but this was at a time where like kind of listening to how people tell you how to write plays had a greater currency than now so she sort of tried to change it and it didn't work and it didn't feel right um and and her instinct was right her instinct was right because that story needed to, to have a form which was appropriate to her relationship with that subject matter <coughs> and to the experience of the characters that she was writing about. So I think the form, the form you find to tell your story is absolutely crucial. The form, like think of that, like Ishi used an analogy before of like being a potter, of like what the shape of that pot is. A pot can be this, a pot can be anything. But don't be told that a pot needs to be bulbous and have a little fancy bit and be covered in flour. A pot can be whatever you want it to be. And hunt to discover what the form is for the story you need to tell because it, it, no, it won't necessarily look like other plays or be like other things. It, and I, I wouldn't presume to speak for you, Ishii, because I, I know your plays far less well, but like it seemed from a, like all your plays I've read, Approaching Empty, which I saw as well, actually it was crucial that those people were there and that waiting was a condition of that play and that the outside world comes in in little bird, oh, the bitch is dead or whatever, because that, that feel, that or well, my sense as an audience is like, that is what it's like to be in that world. Like Becky asked, like, how do you let people in? You let people in by sitting with those people as they're waiting, receiving news, being changed by each other. So the form your story can take is dependent upon the kind of what you want to explore and the conditions of the people in the place. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So this is something uh, that I said this morning which has really sort of sat with me since then as well. Write the play for you. Write the play that you want to write, how you want to write it. Don't second guess, oh, what the audience, and write it that, like, I, this is, this is what I want these characters to say, and this is what I want these characters to do, and this is how I want these characters to behave with each other, you know. Um, and then we can figure it out from there, you know? Uh, get to the end. It's always really important to get to the end. Uh, and it's a really difficult thing. Uh, I'm just going to sort of, you know, not go into sort of as much detail as, 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 as Chris on a specific, but a couple of things that I just think that are really helpful like getting to the end, you know, try, uh, this is difficult, everybody has a process, I always try and, and figure out what's going to happen at the end, not completely, you know, it's going to be a tragic end, it's going to be a happy end, you know, and if, just that, People, it's going to be happy and it's a bit more complicated than late but it's a great place to start like it's going to be uplifting the end we're going to feel uplifted we're going to say ah, I'm so glad for those characters or I'm going to be like devastated for these characters and then go all the way over here and start writing it knowing that I've got to get them to that point of tragedy so I've got to seed in all these things that actually when we get to the point of tragedy we're going to say we knew him so well and how devastating is that for us to find out because we know how many kids he's got and we know how important it was for Billy to stay in town and we know how this and I've fed you all these sort of things and then pull that rug away and thought oh, it's, but it's not going to happen for him or vice versa Sort of like, this is it, this is, in wipers, this is it. We've never seen guns like this, you know, the, the shells rain down like the monsoons and all this sort of thing, and you think they're going to die, they're going to die, these guys. They're going to die a tragic death in a foreign land, cold and hungry. And that's where we start off, and we slowly get to a place of understanding and, and, and brotherhood and fraternity and hope 
We don't know what happens to them. The play ends. The barn doors open. We don't know what happens after that. But we start off in a really dark and grim place and we bring it to a place of hope. So when you're thinking about it, think, try and sort of think, if I'm going to give them hope here, let's give them darkness here. And if I'm going to give them darkness here, let's give them hope here because that will give you then a journey to across to aim for across the, the you know the the life of the play you know the the 90 minutes of it you're aiming for something aren't you you can say right it's going to be tragic this so let's give them hope and over 90 minutes take that hope away and make it a tragic ending and vice versa it's going to be a happy ending well let's make it grim over here because then our play is going to be about how these characters get from this dark place to this place of light and I think that really helps because it gives you something to aim for and you're not writing into cul-de-sac thinking, oh, I wonder what am I supposed to do? Because you always have that thing, well, I've got to incrementally give them hope and give them things that will give them hope. And that's the bit that you then have to think of. <laughs> and that's the bit that's a hard bit of what are those things going to be that will give them hope at the end. But I think that's really a useful sort of place to start with it in your thinking of it and r typing is the last thing you need to do <laughs> think about it Spend, you know the, it's really fun not typing thinking about <laughs> it because you think about it in art galleries or watching other plays or going for long walks I think ah, I wonder what would happen if I give him a glass eye how many children have they got how old are they how many boys how many girls What's all that about? What type of house do they live in? How do they live in that type of house? It's all great fun. It's sort of playing, isn't it? And, you know, uh, you do it everywhere and in the car and walking along the street and walking in a park or sitting in the library or walking through an art gallery, pondering it all. And then the hard bit comes of having to sit there and transfer that into things, carry a notebook, write everything <laughs> down so you don't fall or dictaphone or... Uh, on my walks, I literally will send myself 10 emails. Uh, I walk for an hour, and they'd be like, oh, no. I'll send myself, <laughs> don't want to forget that, and I'll send myself an email just so I, I have an order. Yeah. Try voice notes, this year. Yeah, Sorry? voice notes Try might voice be notes. a little bit better for you. Just, just press sort a button. Of <laughs> yeah, press a button. We'll like show you that. off there. And I'm always scared I'll just wipe out my, uh, um, my list and <laughs> you know, contact list or something. So I'm hearing from both of you permission to have fun and permission to trust your instincts feels like two imperatives yeah. for writers. May I say one other thing? Of with course that? you yeah, may. Uh, that, um, that everyone is really smart and everyone is a storyteller. And to remember that, but because uh, it, you, whatever, you, whatever you give people, it might be different for the two people sat next to each other, but you know, the, the great kind of chain reaction that begins to happen is that even if you feel like you're giving too little in terms of information, detail and stuff, whatever we're all given, we'll start to enjoy kind of piecing that together as well. Thank you. Um, can I get a show of hands if anyone does have a question? Amazing. One, two, three, four. Oy. OK, I've got a microphone and I'm going to come over with it. And I think it is very easy to operate. Is it already on, Sam? It's already on. OK, Ben, I'm going to come to you first, if that's OK. I'm just going to hand it over to you, and then I'll sit back down. Do you mind just passing the microphone to the next person once you've done your question? Yes. Thank you. Um, hi, um, my, my question was um, was for Ishii, really, but I'm open to everyone, obviously. But like, I just wondered if there was, when you were approaching writing uh, Wipers, which obviously has more of a sort of historical uh, context to it, whether you changed your approach at all, whether you felt like, do I have to research more in advance or can I just crack into the writing and get going and move the research in as I go? Or sort of how was, how was your process for that? Uh, so my process for that, again, coming back to just sort of who I am as a character, uh, I, I, I researched the things that I needed to know. So there'd be things like, they need a gun. The soldiers, they've got guns. Okay, I research what guns, what type of guns there were. I, there was some drafts 
where it said, pass me your Enfield Mark 42 rifle. And then when you read it, you thought, well, they wouldn't talk like that, you know, to each other. So that was out. It was important. I knew that it was an Enfield Mark IV, you know, bolt action rifle. It wasn't for everybody else. It's a gun. So, you know, so I, I, I researched the bits that I, I needed to know. Uh, so as I was writing, I'd get to a part, part and I'd, I'd think, oh, um, what they're going to eat, right, what I need to find out, what did Indian soldiers have in their ration pack, right, I'll go and research that. There are other writers, I think David Hare reads about 50 books on any subject that he reads, that's not my process, so with anything, and even contemporary stuff, you don't know everything, there's lots of googling that goes on, so you j it's sort of like, what do I need to know, I need to know, um, this guy's a manual fan. Uh, how old is he? He's 50. When did he go to his first match? 1974. What game was it? Okay, let's Google manual fixture list. 1974. Uh, I've set it in the summer, uh, in the spring, so it would have been Manchester United at home to Tottenham Hotspur, and Bobby Charlton scored the first ball. Right, that's enough. That'll do for me. And then in the say. I remember my dad took me to the Man U game and Bobby Salton scored a goal. Somebody was to Google that and say, oh, yeah, yeah. But it's enough for me to know. I don't need to know any other games. I need to know what happened, what was the game in spring because I've set my play in spring. So that's how I work. Again, coming back to that inherent laziness of sort of thinking, do I need anything else? No, I just need that bit of information. That's, that's really important to me. It's amazing how much you absorb just by, you know, d uh, observing the world around you. People, TV, and soak these sort of things up and, and, and you know, they, they somehow automatically seem to regurgitate themselves and you think, oh, that's interesting, I'll remember that from somewhere, and, and that goes in as well. Brilliant, thank you. We're running slightly over, so what I'm going to do is just five more minutes of questions, but maybe just um, bite-sized responses right. so we can get as many people as possible. Who else has a question? Yeah, this gentleman here, and then we'll come to you. Hi. Uh, this question was following on what Ishi mentioned, but of course it's open for everybody. Um, Ishi, we're talking about how you introduce um, layering, right? So different parts of the story come uh, gets unfolded. Uh, I'm thinking of how that contrasts to sort of place where there's a narrator or where you're breaking the fourth wall and things like that was so direct to the audience versus revealing it through conversation. So my, my question broadly is, what do you think of the role of the narrator or the breaking the fourth wall? Sort of like the modern family type TV show type things which break it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I think what Chris said was, was, was on point, especially with that question, what does that play need? Does that play need for someone to directly talk to the audience. Is that the best way we're going to tell this story? And if that's the best way, well, then use it. And be open to, to what other people experience. Because what happens, in my opinion, is you sometimes, as, as the sort of writer, you can't see it for the, you can't see the wood for the trees. So be open to what people are sort of, you know, offering up and saying, well, perhaps it might be better if you had a narrator because there's lots of bits that actually we just really n just need to tell because it's a complicated thing. Or, well, actually, what if the narrator didn't tell that to the audience, but we faced him that way and we turned the narrator into a character and th it comes out of it. So it's what, what, the, what the play needs, I think. Is a, is I a think you're right. And I think your modern family um, reference is useful in, the, in a way that television has kind of, you know, develop the sense of like who we are, how present we are as an audience in theatre, completely. And like, I, you know, whether that single person who's like with their direct address, whether they're a narrator, I think it's also possible to be, you know, to straddle time for that person to be both describing the action that they are part of and then to suddenly inhabit the action. I've seen a brilliant p plays where actually people are speaking in the second person about themselves, you know, he said, she says, a Nina Seagal play that does that, that's, uh, you know, that she's on this uh, website as well, I think of like, of, you know, amazing way that should be really dry and kind of distanced, but brings people completely to life. Also, where 
one actor might have a central character, but they're playing many, many other characters as well, or different facets of, of self. So I think essentially infinite is possible in theatre, yeah. Brilliant. Next person with a question, um, just at the front here. I don't, I don't know if you've ever seen the, um, a film called Ordinary Love. And it's, uh, <coughs> actually, I found it very boring. <laughs> it, it was really interesting because it was just a couple, but they were brilliant actors and very famous actors. And uh, it would have been a great play. And she just went through a cancer and uh, eventually survived it. And I was just wondering if, you, if you've ever written or for specific uh, uh, actors or actresses. And um, uh, if you've ever tried to write something really boring on purpose <laughs> to help the something to come out in, in, in that way. Um, I, I always sort of picture actors that I want to uh, be who I want to play the part. You know, I was, yeah, sort of like that. Uh, to sort of, yeah, to just give them form. A lot of the time, my characters are an amalgamation of people I've met and I know. So they'll be like, they'll have the temper of, 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 of my physics teacher and they'll walk like my mum and they'll laugh <laughs> like my <laughs> uncle. And it's an amalgamation. And I have a mental picture because as I write, I, uh, <laughs> uh, diff people have different processes. I've, like, it's literally like a film running in my head and I, I, I'm sort of imagining it on stage he stood there he comes in he puts his cup down like that you know <laughs> and i write it i don't know if you've seen uh the corn is green but they had the, the yeah the writer was a character on stage and he's sort of directing the play and writing it as the play is unfolding it was a really good sort of thing you know boring just happens <laughs> you don't I, 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 same with funny and same with emotional it's just it's what the characters say and what you want them to say in that time because you're trying to elicit something and you're trying to create something uh and you just think oh if they said i want it to be boring so if they said that that would be really boring like that I think. but so yeah i always think writers who have the ability to craft a scene where they completely understand the response on the audience and sometimes that can be to sort of uh, dull the temperature in the room so that the stakes of the drama become very static and then suddenly you introduce something that explodes it. If you're able to craft that with an audience, I think it works so spectacularly mm -hmm. on stage, but I think it's really difficult to do. And I think maybe there are some writers who have done that without meaning to and then would take claim for it. But um, yeah, it's a fantastic thing to be able to control an audience yeah. response. I think particularly in film, there's one... Um, there's one play by Arthur Copit, Copit called Wings that was on at the Young Vic with Juliet Stevenson, which was about the experience of someone who'd had a stroke. So it was very intimate in terms of going through that experience with them. And for an audience member who doesn't know what that's like, it's quite alienating. So you're removed from that really intimate experience, but you elicit this huge empathy because of that, because it feels so foreign to you. And by the end, you're so invited into that emotional space. So yeah, that's probably my experience of seeing that on stage. Any other questions? We've got two at the back, and I think we'll wrap it up with these two, if that's OK. Um, so we've got a lady at the back, and then we'll come to you, sir, who's just handed the microphone over. I think it is on. Sam is nodding. OK. Um, when structuring a play, um, it <laughs> Anyway, is it an idea to avoid have an idea of play? What is perhaps a very cliched structure, say, starting at with s where somebody is very old, looking back through their life, obviously it's a very standard way to do it. Would it is it better to say, yes, that works for me, I'll use it, or be more imaginative, explore different ways something could be presented? I think exploration is always exciting and it can yeah. lead you to paths that are unknown to you. I think if you're entering into a creative process where you feel like it's knowable from the beginning, yeah. you've probably got some work to do in terms of playing and that's a really fun space to be in. But I also think it is just 
what you're trying to do is find the truth of your story. And if you've plotted it all out and that's the way you want to tell it, there is no right or wrong way that you should tell that story. It should be however you want to. But certainly I would encourage you to be playful in that endeavour and to explore other options. I, no, I completely agree with Becky and add that if you, as part of that playing process, taking your example of um, uh, someone looking back at their life, you know, one thing that would seem uh, full of potential is to, well, what if you write that person at different times of their life and you force yourself to do it, even if you think that's not going to be in the play, partly as a way of discovering that person. But then what you've got is then you've got, you know, tracts of material that you as the writer can then step back from and sort of like cut and chop and reorder and play with, you know, what in that instance, what might it be like for us as an audience to not have the frame of this is someone looking back on their life, but we see one, two, three, four scenarios play next to each other while we're still piecing together. Is that the same person? Is it not the same person? And like Ishi said about slowly revealing information, maybe, uh, maybe it's only gradually that we come to feel secure that this is one person. Anyway, that's too leading. That's just a bad, bad, <laughs> but like, uh, <laughs> that's just one example of like how that essentially the content of that of what you're describing could take that route that I'm describing it could take the route you gave it could be another way but like Becky said I think generate the material in that sort of first stage and then play with how you might arrange it and kind of compose it brilliant thank you and one last question um yeah hi Hello. Um, we've kind of talked about the um, the creative process from the author's point of view. Obviously, what's different about plays from novels, short stories, poems is that there's a whole other creative cast to come in, your directors, your set directors, your actors, of course. And I was just wondering if there's anything you can do to actually open their space um, so that it becomes a more genuinely open creative space. Every time you write a piece of set direction, you're limiting what the set director can the set designer is going to do. And I was just wondering if there's anything, tips you've got as to how you can leave that place, place as open as possible for the, the rest of the creative process to, to happen once it gets handed over to the theatre. Yeah. Well, you know, I, my, my analogy uh, uh, for a play, this is my sort of take on it, is it's like that uh, uh, a Japanese lacquered box which I don't know if any of you know, these beautiful little boxes that have mm, hundreds of sort of coats of varnish on them and absolutely ex exquisite. My job is to build a box. Everybody else's job is to come and add their coat of varnish to it. So by the end, it's more than the sum of what I've written. I'm always delighted by what other people have done with my work and, you know, sort of quite embarrassed that I get all the credit, you know, whereas so much of it has come from other places and other people's take on what I've written. I thought, actually, I never thought of it like that, but that's better than what I had in my mind. Yeah, I sort of, I suppose, you know, Chris would be a great person, you know, I'd love to hear what Chris has to say. It. I remember watching a thing about, um, What's a Larry David show called? Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. And if you look at a Curb Your Enthusiasm straight, it'll say something like, um, picks up a prostitute, drops her off. And then the rest of it, they just need to write. We need to get from picking the prostitute up to dropping the prostitute off. And the rest of it, they devise that in the moment of that. And I suppose that would be sort of one way you, you know, of, of, of sort of doing it. I've never, I've never worked in such a sharp way myself before. There's always been lots of words, you know, that I present on, on the thing, but always really open to, you know, whatever's going to make it better, whatever's going to make it the best thing that it can be. I, I, I'm always open to that. I think the fact you're asking that question means you would probably be a writer that is interested in those things already. I, all I would say is I love working with playwrights who love being in the rehearsal room, who love seeing things change shape, who love discovering things about what they've done unconsciously that then becomes manifest in the room. Um, and 
who do leave space, but how you leave that space kind of is up to you. Um, and by the same extent, if you absolutely have a clear image of exactly, you know, it's really important that as a visual piece of action or something, it's part of the play that you as the writer are crafting, do it. Don't be sort of polite and think, oh, that's not my job, do it. Um, in the knowledge that anything you write is gonna be kind of essentially translated and given form three-dimensionally by the people working on it um, and try to get as much kind of joy out of that as possible. Um, I think don't be fussy unless, unless there's a really kind of clear reason or image for it. And don't think it's your job to kind of create the setting or the backdrop or anything. Give little nuggets of information that are like little clues, little suggestions, little possibilities, um, and sort of pr productive questions for people to grapple with. And they will, they'll enjoy it. Brilliant. All right, let's um, wrap it up there. Thank you very much for being such a brilliant, attentive audience. And thank you both to Ishi and Chris. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.